Hello there and welcome to Vasgamuva National Park in Sri Lanka and the first vlog up on Symbiotic Society. I'm Linda and without these two gentlemen this whole trip and the video would have not been possible. On my left is Damika, our wildlife officer and on my right is my good friend John who's probably one of the most knowledgeable guides you can find in the entire island. We hope that, that with these videos we can help you connect with wildlife a little bit more and the people behind it who are passionate and hardworking as you can see. Let's get our journey started, I say. You usually get the best bird watching time at dawn, which was evident the following morning when we slowly rolled into a paradise of birds, less than maybe a hundred meters away from our bungalow. Yeah, Brown hair bob. Vasgamuva records one of the highest biodiversity among protected areas in Sri Lanka due to its wide repertoire of habitats. More than 160 birds have been found in this park, which is impressively more than 30% of all bird species found in Sri Lanka. Apart from painted storks, barbets, bee-eaters, kingfishers, spotted doves, eagles and more, we also discovered the peculiar nests of the tiny bayou weaver. Vasgamuva National Park has an incredible biodiversity, not only defined by its mammals or bird life, but also including its freshwater species of fish, many of them endemic, such as the Ceylonese comtail or the stone sucker. Let's not forget the diverse range of reptilian residents of Vasgamuva, including the endemic painted lip lizard or Sri Lanka bloodsucker. I would say very much so. A lot of the people who come here come more to drink and have fun and go off-roading than actually appreciate the vast ecological diversity that this national park has to offer. And I've also seen areas in the close proximity of the park, in the proposed buffer zone areas, that have suffered quite significant damage due to the acceleration development activities. Oh, and of course, the Pallegama Laggala area, which is a other state forest land that connects Vascamo to Nakos, that has pretty badly been ravaged. That area was pristine, the same area we drove through until very recently, thanks to a certain number of development projects. And those projects have really changed the landscape of this entire area. And there is no singular solution. Uh, what I will say is it's about achieving a balance. Sustainable development combined with utilizing ecotourism and managing protected areas properly. That would be the best advice I can give. But of course, there are other aspects to take into account, such as people's livelihoods, the lack of general income in these areas and also the minimal support that is given from the central government. Now, as we'll probably see later today, some of the watch huts 
which were built specifically at key reservoirs such as Dambara and Wilmitia, were built there to provide observational capacity for visitation. But those watchtowers or watch huts have actually been left un... Well, they haven't been developed properly over the past few years and they've fallen into disrepair. Funding is a good way to improve the infrastructure and trails and facilities and encourage more people to come and visit Baskam. The wildlife here is still exceptional though, which we truly acknowledged on the third day, thanks to another encounter with Asian elephants that perhaps topped all the previous ones we had earlier. And we had no idea that was possible within the very same trip. Just a note, when you see elephants throwing mud on the top of their own backs, it actually has a purpose. It, this is to protect from mm -hmm. ticks and other insects and also from the excess heat. Just like the fired up female yesterday, today's agenda had an unexpected visitor too. A bigger, stronger male and also way more chilled out. What we're seeing right now, he's not part of that family. Uh, he's just going there to find any receptive females to mate. Just make sure when you see the movement of these animals, just try to not stand in their way because they're already dealing with enough stress from many other different factors. that is communication. Let's be very clear about the difference. Okay, so what does that mean that they just did? So basically they're calling the rest of their extended family towards them to coop because they're most likely going to move down to Dambara or ever together as a group. Okay. As they approach us, everybody be very quiet. Don't make a sound. Just observe and watch them. So the entire group now just decided to move straight towards the jeep. They seem calm. But just in case, we're trying to make sure they're not going to charge or get scared. Just right, stay give still. Them yeah. so just not give them a reason. They might be about 15 meters. 15 meters away from 15 the jeep. 15 meters and closing. Wow, just wow. Don't make a sound, just observe and watch them. On our right hand side. So right now, while this group of Asian elephants are offering like the best opportunity for a photograph, just posing in front of the Knuckles mountain range, 
another herd of uh, wild water buffalo is approaching us in front of the jeep and we also just heard the alarm call of spotted deer which can mean the presence or actually can only mean the presence of a, a leopard yeah. of a leopard it's estimated as according to IUCN that there's as little as 3500 to 4000 true wild water buffalo left in existence on the planet asiatic wild water buffalo in comparison there could be many as 60 to 80000 domestic water buffalo and they are two separate species the domestic water buffalo is Bubalis bubalus and the true wild water buffalo is Bubalis are two separate species that genetically diverged about 13 to 40000 years ago is a genetic deformity and it actually I've seen it happen in domesticated water buffalo as well where they have horns going all over the place you know down up left right center um, and we've also seen it more recently because even the true wild water buffalo gene appears to be under pressure because there's simply not enough to go around and there's a potential for inbreeding as well so it's vital that more research is properly done The time is 5 a.m. now. Uh, today we're waking up a little bit more early. We just have tea and leave um, since it's our last day in Vazgamuwa and in search of the Sri Lankan uh, leopard and sloth bear. We're going to head off now. You're much more likely to find them in the early morning hours. So we didn't really have luck so far with the uh, with the big carnivores. However, yesterday night, just in a bungalow, we were having dinner and we heard some noises. Also, one of the rangers called us in the back. And what we saw was is a golden palm civet, which is a very, not, not really common sighting, very rare, rarer than to spot a leopard. And this little cat is also a Sri Lankan uh, specimen, endemic to the island. So it was a quite special thing to see. And we uh, also managed to uh, take a nice shot of the golden palm civet. just spotted a beautiful bull elephant in the morning lighting <laughs> I was just saying that actually two egrets one egret is following him everywhere like they are best friends but it actually has a meaning so it's basically a mutually a mutually beneficial partnership whereby whenever the elephant picks up any grass or any other example of vegetation and turns up the soil he automatically churns up insects and any other small examples of fauna that the egrets love to eat and in return, sometimes, the egret will actually jump on the elephant's back and keep eating any ticks, mites, lice and fleas on the elephant, almost as a form of pest control, and in that way they both benefit from each other. We drove through some potential spots for leopards, like rocky outcrops, but ended up without a single sighting. It's not because there are less leopards here than in more visited parks like Yala Vilpatu, but because the leopards in the Mahavali region are less or not used to the presence of jeeps and humans, so they quickly sneak into the bushes before you lay your eyes on them. Mahavali leopards, or leopards in the Mahavali region, are a very misunderstood, unknown segment of the total leopard population in Sri Lanka. Even uh, certain environmental organizations, such as the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society, refer to them as the ghosts of Waskamo, and that's coming from a national park that is probably the most visited of all the protected areas in the Mahabali region. Do you think it's also because of there's a shortage of wildlife experts and biologists Absolutely. in the country? And even with the wildlife experts that we have, and the biologists, the field guides, the ornithologists, the specialists, they all focus on more... They all focus on regions of the country that are considered more popular and more ecologically diverse. If I can make a personal appeal, if there's anybody who is passionate and or 
in the field as a leopard expert or somebody who's learning about leopards, yes. please contact one of us and we can help set up a anything to do with leopard research or we can try our best to help facilitate that mm -hmm. because Good that would know. really help and we can do this in conjunction with the Department of Wildlife Conservation and that would really help with future conservation efforts for Mojave region leopards. No big carnivores in the end, but we stumbled upon something equally amazing, a specimen that I personally haven't seen before in the wild. Here, right here. Most here. White spotted everything. What we just encountered is something that we were hoping for, but not really in the daytime. So we have just seen a white spotted chevreton or mouse deer, um, and it's a very rare sighting. Also, these animals are highly nocturnal, uh, which means they are mostly active in the nighttime, and you have a very little chance of spotting them in the daylight, which we just did. The peace of Vazgamuva is on another level. I cannot help but wonder about the future of this unique home and how we can all play a part in protecting it. So sustainable tourism will play a big role because it will allow people in these areas, in villages such as Handangamu and the villages that border the Mahaveli, including beyond the River Rhine Nature Reserve and on the other side on the Kaluganga and Ambanganga boundaries, to actually earn a livelihood from the national park itself as opposed to potentially engaging in illicit activities which basically consist of harvesting resources of all types from this national park. So tourism has a key role to play there, but again, as I said earlier, it's about achieving a balance where sustainable tourism basically allows us to create a proper model by which we don't overcrowd the national park, but at the same time we provide buffer zone communities with alternative incomes to their current income sources. A lot of people don't realize that there is so much more to explore than just the 10 to 15 percent that people traditionally associate with this park. When visitors come here, what I've realized is they normally just go on safari in the southern portions of the park, close to the main entrance. So we're talking Sansta Pitya, maybe go towards Yudhugana Pitya, towards the Mahaveli Beat Office, the campsite, and then come back around Kudakadru Pitya, towards Mahakadru Pitya, and that round. But actually, there's a lot more inside Waskamo that there is to explore. And I think if people really want to get an idea of what Baskamo has to offer, they should come for at least three nights, four days, a uh, circuit bungalow booking or a circuit campsite booking, and just travel around and see what Baskamo has to offer. That would be my best advice to them.